favorite challenges, as we all know, one of humanity's most pressing challenges. Its effects are already being felt. Without urgent and concerted actions, climate change will seriously affect the wildlife in all of our countries. Damage fragile ecosystems and threaten global security through migratory pressures and resource conflicts. While these mere efforts may help, the scale of the response required for the real solution is so large that immediate and widespread action is essential. Climate change, its causes, and its adverse impacts are closely linked to economic development, the alleviation of poverty, and energy security. All countries have a legitimate right to economic development, but that need not conflict with strategies to address climate change. While solutions to the climate change problem require harmonization of climate growth and policy adaptation with ambitious emissions reductions, they also present tremendous opportunities for innovation and technological development, especially in the energy field. In addition, providing clear energy to the 2 billion people currently without access to modern energy services would contribute to poverty elevation and achieving the million development goals as well as to emission reductions. Least developed countries are the most vulnerable to climate change. Failure to adapt will increase the economic and human impact of extreme events and set back policy allegation efforts. Clearly, future efforts for dealing with climate change must address mitigation as well as adaptation. Many scientific experts believe that the temperature rise above 2 to 2.5 Celsius degrees risks serious impacts. With rising temperatures, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts that the frequency of heat waves, droughts, and heavy rainfall events will very likely increase. Adverse affecting agriculture, forests, water resources, industry, human health, and settlements. Developing countries where greater poverty and vulnerability limit the capacity to act will be the most seriously harmed, particularly the poor segments of their populations. Avoiding such a future requires global greenhouse emissions to peak in the, in the next 10 to 15 years, followed by substantial reductions of at least 60% by 2050 compared to 1990. A formidable task that requires international cooperation and collective action without any delay. The cost of taking action now, however, is small. About 1% of global GDP, according to the Stern EU. And the benefits are large compared with the much heavier penalties of delaying action. The cost of both mitigation and adaptation will rise substantially with delay. Since climate change is a long-term problem, it cannot be successfully addressed through short-term and country-based actions. Resulting in the climate crisis require international cooperation at all levels, from bilateral to regional to global. A future global agreement 
negotiated under the auspices of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, has had a long-term target to stabilize the concentration of greenhouse gases at a level that prevents dangerous interference with the climate system. Such a long-term target should be pursued for periods of time longer than Kyoto's five-year commitment period. <coughs> An initial 2015-2020 commitment period, coupled with a monetary and review mechanism, would facilitate the development of a more flexible and effective country-based strategies. Second, would provide more certainty for public and private investors. And third, would allow for mid-course corrections as scientific knowledge evolves. Any global climate change agreement must be comprehensive. It should include all countries, all sectors, all sources and sins, and mitigation as well as adaptation. A new agreement, however, will be successful only if it is perceived by all participating countries to be critical, requiring all countries to achieve the same percentage reduction in emissions in the next commitment period would be unfair. Developed countries should take the lead in emission reduction, given their historic responsibility and capability to act. Nevertheless, that alone will not be sufficient to avoid the most adverse and possibly hero of the solid impacts of climate change. Meaningful engagement in developing countries, especially the rapidly industrialized economies, is needed also. In that perspective, the discussion about clean growth and a shift in energy paradigm is central. If we are not able to deploy available technologies, and invest massively in the development uh, of new ones, tackling climate change will be out of our reach. No collective action can be organized if development concerns are not taken on board. There is a strong rationale to act. Energy security, and Albert Bresson from Columbia University will address that question. Climate security and Laurent Soutiana from Sciences Po, you get it, you dwell on that. And global climate policy will have to support, to support domestic energy policy, not to regulate them. Professor Tzu from Pekin University will look at that from a Chinese perspective. And Barta Mukobadai, President of the Center for Policy Research, will talk about the policy. Thank you. central component in uh, putting in place the, the strategy that uh, Richard de Coin has just uh, described. 80% of uh, these emissions are uh, energy linked. Hence the question before the, the panel today, can we reconcile the imperatives of growth with the need to reduce carbon emissions and adopt a new energy paradigm? comes from a more efficient use of what we have. 
Second, we need to mobilize all energy sources, including nuclear. There is no silver bullet. Three, to green the energy mix, electricity is a fantastic uh, vehicle, a fantastic uh, uh, energy uh, medium. Therefore, expect the electric uh, rechargeable uh, car and uh, expect a massive electrification of society beyond what we have already. Four, this must be done in a cost-effective manner, which requires the use of a market market instruments as many as we can, and also requires that we bear in mind the, the very recent but very famous already McKinsey carbon abatement cost curve, which shows that some things can be done actually at a profit, others at a slow, at a low cost, and others at a very high cost. In politicians very often start from the, the more expensive ones, which happen to be the more spectacular or the more uh, ego enhancing, but the McKinsey curve is a good discipline. Uh, and five, last point, although the market is essential, we are so close to reaching this 550 uh, ppm limit that we have to accelerate technological innovation. So these five points, I think, uh, would be accepted by uh, most people. Uh, I you know, take them, for example, from the uh, IEA uh, energy scenarios and similar work. They, they embody what we need, we should be doing. Does that mean that this will be put in place uh, easily? Well, listening to Richard Lequin, we could, we could hear how already this policy of uh, climate mitigation or climate change adaptation interferes, overlaps with other very valuable and legitimate policies, empowering the, the, the energy uh, poor of today, economic development, security, and other such policies. So the question is not uh, an ingenious question. It is not how, what is the right mix of uh, technologies and behaviors, but it is also what is the set of policies, what is the set of institutions that will deliver this change. Before talking about these institutions, let me nevertheless play David's advocate for a second and say there would be a situation where we would need to do this in any case, we would have no choice. This would be if we had reached PICOL. And actually you will read quite often that because, quote unquote, we are at peak oil, we have no choice but to change the energy mix and in the process we can take care of this climate agenda. Now, when I was at Shell, I did not hear the word oil very often. You have oil fields, gas fields, but actually what you produce as a company is called liquid. It's called liquid because you get your liquid either from an oil field or from condensate in a gas field or increasingly from other sources. Shell had a small plant in Bintulu, Malaysia, to produce oil liquid out of gas. There is now a massive one being uh, created in Qatar, uh, Exxon, and also Shell uh, are working on that. Here in China, there are plants uh, in place to produce liquid out of coal, coal to liquid. You can think also of biomass to liquid. So, in a sense, you can have as much oil equivalent, as much liquid as, as you want. And you may hear about peak oil, but I don't think you ever heard about peak liquid. It does not sound right, peak liquid. Actually, it's not that we don't have enough liquid or, or hydrocarbons. We, we have too much. Uh, you may have read that a few weeks ago, South Korea and the United States had resumed work on uh, methane hydrates uh, along the coast of uh, South Korea. There is 10 times the hydrocarbon equivalent in these uh, hydrates than there is in uh, the known uh, oil and, and gas field. Now, it would be a disaster if you take them from the bottom of the sea and release the methane in the process of doing so. So, the problem is not that we do not have enough uh, hydrocarbons and we would have to change the energy mix anyway. The problem is that we have to deliver the objectives that uh, Richard described a few minutes ago. And this will take explicit policies and explicit uh, institutions. Now, 
This means, therefore, it's a subject for public policy schools. And one thing we know in public policy schools is that, to quote uh, Nobel laureate Douglas North, institutions are created to serve the interests of those in the, with the power to shape the creation and design of these institutions. The interest of those actors, not some uh, abstractly defined global public good. So the question, therefore, is what are the interests that will shape these institutions and policies, irrespective of the enlightened objectives we, we may have for them in, in thinking about them? This morning we heard from Dean uh, Makubani of uh, his experience at the UN and how UN ambassadors uh, end up uh, uh, protecting not the planet but uh, national uh, interests. I'm sure that what is true at the UN in general is true also at the UNFCCC. Uh, yes, there must be enlightened participants, but there must be a lot also of uh, defense of uh, national uh, interest. How can we imagine a system in which these national interests are not at odds with the climate adaptation and mitigation objectives? Well, Let's, let's consider in which uh, space this, uh, these policies have to be deployed. You have three sorts of participants. You have three sorts of interests. You have market interests. You have values in the global civil society, those who care about the climate change. And you have national interests, the broad gamut of them. In, in short, you could see three, three elements there. Globalization, world democracy, and sovereignty. If we were lucky, the three would come together. However, uh, I like very much what uh, Daniel Roderick, uh, the Kennedy School, uh, wrote on this subject. Uh, Daniel Roderick uh, uh, was the designated last year the, the Hirschman, Albert Hirschman uh, scholar. And he had that observation a few years ago that if you think of globalization, Democracy and sovereignty as three valuable objectives, you can have two of them, but never the three. You cannot have at the same time a world democratic system and uh, globalization and sovereignty. Without going into details of why this is uh, so, but let me let me say that we use that when we design the, the shell scenarios to capture the environment in which uh, energy policy would be framed. And to make a long story short, you end up with three possible environments. And I think the sort of institutions and, and policies that would uh, emerge in these three uh, policy environments would be, would be quite different. One, the first, if you think of these environments, think of which of these three elements of globalization, world democracy, and, and sovereignty you know, takes a second seat and, and lets the two other uh, come together. The first type of environment is the European style environment, where you have strong globalization forces and strong democratic, cross border democratic uh, forces. And therefore, as you can see in Europe, sovereignty is reduced. A member of the EU uh, doesn't have the possibility to opt out of the 2020-20 rules or to uh, opt out of the EU ETS or not to take part in uh, the clean development uh, mechanism. Now, this is one environment in which uh, the, the critical uh, variables are the, the price for carbon and uh, the global debate as uh, fostered by the IPCC, and you could very well, you could in theory imagine that what exists in Europe now extends uh, towards uh, the rest of the world through the, the post-2012 uh, negotiations. I personally greatly doubt this, because I think it is quite specific to Europe to accept such a reduced role for sovereignty uh, today. And I think it would be good if other countries did it, and we from the, the former, the, the next uh, speaker, but in practice, over the last five, ten years, uh, since 2001, basically, 
we have seen a reaffirmation of, of sovereignty rather than a reduction. So then there is the US type of policy environment where you have globalization and sovereignty coming together and where therefore any sort of world democratic debate takes a second seat. But in such an environment, uh, you can have what we see with Reggie or the West Coast Climate Initiative, you can have uh, uh, national initiatives, but they stop at the border. And then it is a very intense uh, process of intergovernmental negotiations, a give and take, uh, to see what other countries would uh, contribute. Uh, the type of policy and institution that would emerge in a US style environment, for example, would not include a CDM type of uh, mechanism or very, very important. There would be a national centricity. And then, of course, you have a third type of environment, and I finish with this one, which is the, the, the old one, the old fashioned one, where globalization is not a major force, and you are left with sovereignty and democracy at the national level. Well, in such an environment, uh, Richard was talking about uh, energy security, this is what you see emerging as, as a policy. You, you do not have within a narrow national environment, you have no reason to go for a global public good, except if you were in a very, very large country. But in most countries, that doesn't make sense. So you will end up with policies that will touch on the same instruments, like uh, biofuels, uh, green electricity, but that will do so from a different perspective, a perspective of uh, reducing uh, dependence on quote unquote uh, Middle Eastern oil or uh, of increasing uh, energy dependence. This is a uh, you know, third environment. And we conclude therefore by you know, coming back to the, the question we were presented with. Uh, is it, uh, can we reconcile uh, growth carbon emission reduction and the new energy paradigm? Yes, we can technically, but we are not compelled to do so by any sort of decoid type of situation, and therefore all will depend on the type of institutions and policies that emerge, and this itself will be shaped by what would have been called a few years ago a world order, uh, but because of the market side, the civil society side, maybe the no, world order is, is too large. Uh, sometimes I have to this uh, just as the jet stream out there. What the next American president puts in place, the sort of spirit he brings to uh, the global uh, round table will be very important. And we can see three very different environments emerge, and they will condition what sort of institutions and policies are really feasible. I'm sure we'll explore that further in the next uh, presentation. Thank you.
policies and proposed energy policy is certainly at the core of what affects all sovereignty. But on the other side, uh, we are in a period where we have to accelerate the movement. In 1997, we had a sort of a, quite a long time before us. Now, uh, time is pressing, and any action, we have to have all this action put in place in the end next year. So there is a contradiction there where we know that we have to go from a top-down approach like Kyoto to a much more bottom-up approach, respecting domestic choices, trying to coordinate between sovereign nation states. And at the same time, we have to do this painful coordination anyway in a time in a time horizon which is absolutely short. So there is a, here a contradiction to get finally an agreement because of these two dimensions. So what can we what can, can we say and how is this is this compatible uh, with sustained growth, particularly in developing countries? Um, which anyway would be, as Richard said, uh, uh, a condition of having any deal. I think in a way we know that uh, we have, of course, these three criteria to get people on board for an agreement, effectiveness, efficiency, and equity. Effectiveness, uh, of course, demands this long-term goal. Uh, and we know that for, by 2050 we will have to have the global emissions. It's, it's not easy, it's of course easy to say, it. it's not difficult to achieve. Just uh, if we look at the actual bills that have been currently discussed in the United States, and of course everybody sees as a very positive movement, movement that uh, energy and climate bills are on the table of the, of the Congress. But when we look at the numbers that the USA is actually discussing, uh, the only thing they can propose for 2020 is go back to the 1990 level of emissions. So getting half of the global emissions, that means 80% of reduction for developed countries, is not an easy task anyway, even if, as I said very rightly, we have the technology, at least half of them, and, and, and we, we know a little where we should deploy the, the new or all the global new ones. So, so we need for effectiveness, we need a very strong action. But the different thing from Kyoto is at that time we knew that we could let developing countries and particularly emerging countries do their job and join after. Now this after is now. So we have to have them on board. We have to have a reduction in emissions, not now, but in uh, uh, around 2050. And it is important even for countries who are much below uh, actual European or, or by large uh, USA levels of emission of per capita. Even China, even if China is well below the actual European levels, not to speak about US, we know that China cannot just pursue the business as usual. And, and I know, of course, the Chinese government is looking at this very seriously with, with a very strong plan. Equity, uh, we know that in 2050 we will need to have a sort of about an average of two tons of emission per capita uh, to go to one ton after 2050. Again, very difficult objective. Uh, Europe is around 10 tons per capita these days. China is about four tons, something like that, between four and five. Uh, India is still below two tons. Uh, but then, you know, the US are about 20. So again, equity, we know the global target. How to get there it is something quite tricky. But anyway, if we don't have equity in the principle embedded in the agreement, we will not go nowhere. We know that we have to use market instrument. Uh, energy will be about invest, private investment, maybe not only public one, of course. It's about carbon markets and the use of carbon markets. Uh, but again, there is an Indian and isn't it there? We can use carbon market in Europe to try to use it and it functioning well, it did quite well. Certainly uh, United States will to try to build one and some other countries as well. But when we talk about carbon markets together between developing countries and developing countries, there there is a problem because of course the developing countries and, and particularly uh, the emerging countries are afraid of having a 
sort of hidden agenda behind the current market idea. And maybe, because that means that at one stage you will have to have uh, an economy-wide target uh, of emission, and that is of course unacceptable these days at that stage of the discussion and on the development uh, levels. So even the instruments are not that easy to use because for uh, genuinely good political reasons. So we have instruments. We have, for example, for an investment who can deploy new technology, but, but then we have institutions of property, intellectual property rights who are not in place really to, to, to support this movement. We have this notion of if we have a carbon market, then we, we, uh, we are going in a track where maybe some companies wouldn't like to. So we have to invent new arrangements and new, new, new models to allow this very good instrument to be used in a way that supports sovereignty and domestic choices and that not seems to really prevent them. One way is to go to sectoral approaches because countries may be monitoring better some sectors like, for example, uh, cement or steel. Um, we can invent some systems at international, level, at international level that will support these energy policies. Uh, like something like that, uh, the adjustment policies, but without the conditionality package, something like that. How, how the international community can, can support through lending, through investment, uh, sound energy policies, but again, without the conditionality package, which is, of course, unacceptable in that condition. So we have solutions. Uh, we, we know where to go. We have the instrument, but really, again, the political conditions are not easy to, to, to mobilize. And of course, we know that the changing the energy paradigm uh, can be a source of growth and development. Some estimates uh, that uh, show that the clean technology can represent an investment of 500 billion a year by 2020. So there is jobs and, and uh, development there. But the governance issues still are very, very strong. In a way, when Albert was thinking about the sovereignty, uh, democracy, uh, global globalization trade-offs or combination, uh, in a way, it should be necessary to redefine or have a new definition of sovereignty to allow for uh, more autonomy being in more in better rules. And in that sense, the financial crisis certainly can be an example of this. You can have more autonomy if you have this, uh, better rules at the national level. But then we have a problem of the grouping and on the, so who is negotiating and, and where. Pascal Lavi this morning saying uh, climate has a sort of place to be discussed, like the black trade has a place to be discussed, and it is the UNFCC, United Nations Convention for Combating Climate Change. But is that place functional? I remember uh, Pascal even said that this morning that he said that the WTO was a sort of medieval institution. In a, in, in a sense, UNFCC can be considered like this as well, because even if it's more balanced, more developing developing country, uh, not that much asymmetry in the, in, the, in the setting, but it is not effective and does not always, of course, reflect the real power uh, and the real national interest. Uh, the G77 group, for example, the developing group, mm -hmm. is more being more and more a coalition for the no diplomacy than to find proactive solution. So are there other fora more, uh, more adapted? A G, some, G plus something? Uh, any other club model? Again, in this uh, global issue, we see that the actual institutions are not really adequate to tackle the problems. There are trade-offs. There are forms, and certainly uh, we are looking for a sort of more reduced discussion between the five finalists, the 17 or the 16 more, uh, the biggest emitters in the planet, and not the whole, the whole block. So GPPN discussion in this could help a lot. Uh, first, I think of all of what we have now, uh, making uh, at the global level understand what are the local debate and how the local debate can be linked with a global discussion. And I think that's very important because of this bottom-up approach, which is necessary now. Second, I think we need to, to have a lot of investment and research in policies that can support this energy shift. It's about an industrial revolution. What are the public policies that can support that? It's not that evident. We have examples in the past. Can we use that for the future? And what, what
what does means public policies to support this energy shift within a globalization context, which is that, that which is really the new question. Thank you. Protection, and the 
most critical challenge would be to change the government structure so that it becomes effective. In China, the central government takes the position of the true owner of the national environment and the critical natural resources, while everyone else, including local governments, function as de facto users. A system, a system of common is created. In this setting, local government will try to maximize rent for the local economy from using the natural environment and resources, and leave the burden of cleaning up to the central government. From media, we all can see that this cat and the mouse game almost every day, whereas the central Ministry of Environmental Protection function as the environmental god of the society, and all the local figures were portrayed as the bad guys. If this phenomenon doesn't change, there's no hope that China will get on the path of environmental improvement. Related to this is very little recognition of the roles of local initiatives, market and the role of NGOs. If you are interested, I can give you a rich list of local initiatives that are effective and efficient. They were just yet to be recognized in the policy making process. All we hear is the urge to increase investment, uplift status of the central authority, expansion of bureaucracy, and step, step up law enforcement, etc. And related to this is lack of recognition of local difference of value and the cost of environmental improvement. The uniform and the rigid environmental policy has been making pollution control a very costly effort for local economies, therefore reduce the incentive and the effectiveness of pollution control at the ground level. From our field experiences, as well as integrated knowledge developed over the years in environmental sciences, I can point to a few areas worthy of serious consideration if we want to make progress and be able to cope with the challenges brought about by environmental aggravation and climate change. First of all, local initiatives are important. The heterogeneity of local situations makes it very, very difficult to implement a detailed, rigid, and uniform environmental policy. Local government should be given certain autonomy, time, and resources to come up with their own environmental improvement policy. So I'm kind of advocating environmental federalism here. Secondly, economic incentives are important. Our government is so enthusiastic to try new and stronger command and control measures, such as the air quality project in Beijing municipality. So we're continuing that policy. And the leading to ignorance of the value of the much detailed trials, market, instrument, and economic incentives. In scattered local experiments, market instruments demonstrated the wonderful potential potentials, while at the set, while at the center, the most we can see is the effort to build a higher figure and more expensive central regulatory authority. The example of market instrument at work include the water treatment system Beijing municipality, between Beijing municipality and the upward farmers in the urban province, with which Beijing dramatically lowered the cost of water supply, basically by increasing water supply dramatically. And then that cost is one seventh the potential cost of uh, the water from our uh, future South North water transfer project. And then, thirdly, there seems to be tremendous potential to develop a new strategies. I'm, I'm thinking of two. One is, it's not only based on my own study, but widely recommended in, in the opinion that we should change our environmental strategy. First strategy is, is two strategies uh, 
planet. The first planet came from turning environmental protection uh, attention from focusing on one pollutant to multiple pollutants. And that calls for the focus from end of time pollution control to in the process pollution And uh, we just had a small empirical study that revealed the code benefit if we look at the, the uh, industry technology and we analyze the contribution of different types of technology to air pollution. And what, what we found and we found that the access, that access the use of coal-based energy is the key reason that industry air pollution and the CO2 emission are persistent and hard to tackle. With, with business as usual scenario, people project that coal consumption will continue to grow at the pace of economic growth, if not fast. Our empirical analysis of industry pollution revealed that coal's key factors ex explaining almost all the important air, 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 air and the solid waste pollution. Uh, while there has been serious attempt to reduce gasoline impacts, people have not turned their attention sufficiently yet to deal with the demand for coal ready. We talk a lot, we talk about coal a lot, but uh, our current policy is still a policy that kind of subsidizes coal, 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 coal energy use. We just heard this morning from our national TV, the government promised the price of coal this winter will remain the same as last year. And the government always tries to function as an intermediate between the electricity sector and the coal use of trying to control coal price. These policies will not reduce incentive for excessive coal use, and that has to change. And if we just, just let's think about risk, the marginal cost of coal burning by a little bit, there will be coal benefit of reducing multiple pollutants from our industry sector. And why not be try? The second strategy, uh, strategic choice, as I'm thinking of, is related to this climate change study. And uh, as a developing country, we're developing now, we try to raise income, try to, try to achieve high economic growth. But CO2 emission is severe and growing fast. And what should we do? We certainly want to use the increase our investment and uh, uh, apply clean technology to reduce emissions. But that's costly and uh, even more costly in China than, than, than anywhere else in the world. Then we should look at the market instruments in this climate change uh, strategy process. And uh, China, as many other developing countries, we have compared to the advantage large area, a lot of natural resources, and a large rural population. And the carbon sink, just as our president Guizhi Hao has proposed, can be used as an effective and efficient instrument to reduce the cost of mitigating climate change. And uh, if we use that if, uh, effectively, then the rural farmers can get, get, get increased return from their activity in planting trees manage to choose better and reduce the deforestation. And that serves to reduce the overall cost of the climate uh, the carbon emission, reducing carbon emission, and also increase rural uh, and alleviate rural power. So it's a policy that serves the due purpose of uh, equity and efficiency. And uh, it's not, it, although I'm not going to be there, Usually, in, in the mid-level, sector level, it's not widely recognized, and we should make some effort to make that happen. Thank you.
문제는 들을 것 같아요. 
marlin ecology, uh, increased greening, uh, uh, increasing of forest cover and carbon sinks, we're talking about sustainability of agriculture, uh, largely to deal with uh, adaptation issues uh, in view of the changing of water uh, hydrology as expected with climate change in India, and increased recent. So let me take two of them, which I think are critical at the moment. Algo pension is one of the things uh, that is on which there is consensus, but energy efficiency. And in that, in terms of the actions outlined to meet those commitments, you have a situation where it's largely market based. Sort of take on from the one of the recommendations in China and such um, on the urbanization front, there are two actions. One, regulatory, which essentially be, uh, builds on the energy code for buildings. Uh, something I know that China has been working on quite uh, intensively. And the second is built on urban planning and waste planning. So those are the broad instruments with which market instruments for energy efficiency, urban planning, and building codes on the urbanization side. That's the range of instruments that the government of India sees as using in its climate change action plan. A couple of years ago, before this climate change action plan, we had uh, the integrated energy policy. Uh, there's been some re evolution of now, given the um, our recent efforts in uh, nuclear corporate, several nuclear corporation. Um, but broadly speaking, at that point in time, the focus also was very much on efficiency. And that's largely because of the nature of our past sector and so on, which we had to do in detail in the question and answer sessions. However, relied on a very large focus on increasing coal resources and use of coal, increasing use of hydroelectric resources. A limited nuclear energy option, which may now increase. And very little mention of gas. So, now within this framework that I just outlined for you, what are the lock-in possibilities? Where can we make decisions today that we will regret making 15 years from now, 10 years from now? That's the critical question that I'd like to uh, address the rest of my talk to. Market-based instruments are actually a good instrument at this point in time for energy relief. As compared to more developed countries where residential and transportation uh, uses dominate, industrial uses are the dominant use as far as energy use is concerned in India, as is the case in China. And if you were able to drive prices, industry will respond, because that's a profit motive that's operating. As far as India is concerned, most of our industry, uh, even the more energy intensive industries, even steel for the planet now, is almost entirely in the private sector. And consequently, responses to price signals is relatively high. So you can get a very large bang for the buck if you're moving on the uh, market-based instrument side as far as large point sources are concerned. However, unless you concomitantly have a significant amount of regulation and actual monitoring of that you will not be able to, if there are no negatives in the carrots but no sticks, the chances are that you might see significant fallback in actual performance. If there is no strong monitoring of whether or not people are actually need it. And for that, it, you may need perhaps not as large bureaucracy uh, as uh, was been mentioned about China, a significantly skilled and strong institutional system to look at what's happening on the 
environmental performance tank. However, while they might incentivize individual industrial units, it's difficult for market-based incentives to work with changing energy structures. So what do I mean by that? Let me go back to the issue that I currently mentioned about the integrated energy policy, where the focus on gas, even given uh, India's large fines of gas in recent years, as well as ongoing negotiations for uh, importing of both LNG as well as around Pakistan India pipeline, the emphasis on gas has been relatively muted. What that does is also make it difficult to make investments in gas transportation infrastructure, gas pipelines that move across the region. If you rely purely on private initiative without a very strong certainty of regulation into the future, issues about open access to pipelines, etc., etc., it's extremely difficult to envision a situation where you will have a relatively rich network of gas pipelines across a country. And the importance of gas uh, in the broad system, I'll just come back to in a minute, but this is something that I'd like to leave you with, and this is one of the things. The absence of such an infrastructure is one of the possible lock-ins that I flag out for you. The second is the issue of agricultural energy production. India, perhaps by now, has the largest number of energized agricultural pumps for irrigation, whether by electricity or by diesel. And this particular constituency which essentially says that we need energy in order to feed people, to grow crops, uh, to move out to farmers and so on, essentially creates a particular pricing policy both for electricity as well as for commodities like diesel that makes it difficult to improve energy efficiency in that segment of the economy. So, depending on how we move forward, and we are having this, for example, and the variety of things that bring this forward, uh, which leads to the cultivation of sugarcane in relatively water-stressed areas, which lead to the cultivation of rice, which is a fairly uh, high water-intensive crop, and again, in water-stressed areas, uh, because you have procurement machinery there, and so on and so forth. But there is a whole architecture built around irrigation, electricity, procurement, etc. That could prove to be a stumbling block in making energy efficiency improvements going forward. Let me now come to the second and last chunk of uh, lock-ins in the stock about, which is urbanization. If India has not grown as fast as China, nor has our construction sector been as prominent as China. Yet, with relatively uh, normal levels of depreciation, even given India's growth in construction, which has roughly varied between 6 to 14 percent over the last five years, essentially about a third of the total construction stock in India today is less than five years old. If this trend, and this is where perhaps the financial meltdown might actually provide us some breathing space, uh, if it slows down the investment in real estate, is if this particular pace of building continues, we'll essentially have a building stock that is not energy compliant, that is not energy efficient but is in place. And unless you see these kinds of rates, for example, at, if you're growing in part 15% in about five years, half of the building is coming through. But if 
unless you see these large kinds of raids going on for all, you will be what the decision that you make today about the kind of buildings that you build will be the ones that will have to stay with you for a long period of time to come. But buildings could still be retrofitted. You can double glaze windows, figure out various other kinds of things of getting energy efficiency, get IT to work for increasing energy efficiency, etc. What is more difficult to fix is city forms. What does your city look like? Is it compact city? Uh, or is it less compact? More spread out? Those decisions depend in part on the kind of decisions you're making today about transportation, about land use, and it also depends to some extent about sociological processes. I'll come to that in a second. But fu uh, fundamentally, if your city structure, your form of your city starts to look different, Changing that city form is going to be much harder in India. Uh, I'll be interested to know, uh, the, the changing of the city form is, has been, uh, let's put it this way, city forms in China have changed dramatically in the last 20 years. Uh, and I'd be really interested to understand what kind of consequences that had for uh, energy stuff. But, um, Fundamentally speaking, if city forms in India essentially start to sprawl, then it would be very difficult to bring them back in. Complicating this matter is the fact that cities in India are likely to be large and possibly poor for a long time to come. And part of the sprawl may be essentially that of elites leaving the city to escape or rather build enclaves around for themselves, which then changes the transportation dynamics of that city. Hope is not lost. I mean, uh, the recent, there's a Brookings study on metropolitan cities in the US, and there we find that Los Angeles, which is the traditional embodiment in some sense of all these would be the East Coast, does not perform that badly in terms of per capita carbon emissions compared to Eastern urbanization. We need to understand that stuff a little better. But fundamentally, this it's in the urbanization space, in building structures and city forms, that I see the big lock-in that is beginning to happen for climate change for the problem. And perhaps it's this to which we need to provide a little bit more attention. As well. Thank you. Is the running short? Uh, I suggest we uh, take uh, two or three questions um, for your coffee break. Yes. Misha, thank you. That was an excellent panel. But I must confess that after listening to everybody, I'm still very pessimistic about the subject. And I'll explain why I'm pessimistic because of three reasons which are interlocking. The first reason is that there is a new consensus among Western policymakers, which they now say privately very strongly. They say there's no deal of climate change if China and India do not come aboard. There's no way the West will accept Kyoto anymore. If there's a deal, China and India take part of the deal. The second point is that, this hopefully is good news, is that China and India say yes, we are prepared to be part of the deal, but if we make a sacrifice, you have to make a bigger sacrifice richer countries. And the third point is that the Western politicians, even those who believe in global warming, cannot tell their own populations that they have to accept a bigger sacrifice than China and India if you're going to get a deal on global warming. And I noticed that none of the panelists, by the way, use two critical words, pain and sacrifice. Because frankly, there is no solution to the global warming problem unless you actually administer real pain and sacrifice, give up any of the things you've got used to in consumption in other areas, if you're really going to get a reduction and not just a holding pattern of carbon emissions. So 
Can any member of the panel remove my pessimism? There are really no consequences to this kind that you can actually use. Then you should just go on to the way they are. 
However, if we believe that there is a consequence, and even that's a small chance, it's 0.01% chance. It's 0.01% chance of essentially going up the garden. A very large cost and a very small chance. Do you want to take the chance? Or do you want to try and see as to whether countries like ours can continue to grow significantly such that the millions who are still not having the standard that people should actually be living in can attain that? Is there any other way of doing it? Now, whether or not that way involves pain is something I think we will need to address some point in time. And the question right now, is, I think the point that both Mr. Shu and I and the government of the panel are making, is right now there is a window. There are a number of initiatives that need to be taken where which do not involve pain, but which still involve significant progress around that goal. Whether in the fullness of time when all these options have been exhausted and these low-hanging fruits have been taken, will we have a technology to be able to address these things with lesser pain at that point in time is something that we need to understand. So it's a dynamic thing. We're trying to see, right now we can take a variety of actions which do not involve that much pain, at least from the Chinese and Indian part. And the hope that 20 years from now something will happen that will not force us to have too much pain at that point in time. If it doesn't happen, we will have to do it. Right. So the reason we are changed, we are advocating a different approach, which may involve significant growth, I'm not compromising on growth, is that small chance of a very, very, very big. And this is not about earthquakes, it's not about a you know, few cities getting flooded, it is not about you know, a few droughts around the countryside. It's about something much larger, but there's a very small chance of that. That's the, that's the basic story. Thank you, we are uh, 20 minutes late already, so perhaps I'll take one or two last questions. Yes, ma'am? My question is about China. I think it's very encouraging to hear that China is at a turning point in its environmental policy. Also encouraging to hear that there are local initiatives that combine both equity and efficiency. My question is, what feedback mechanism is there to bring these local initiatives to the attention of national leaders so that they can be leveraged at their regional and, and national levels? Because there seems to be willingness on the part of the central government to, to, to hear about these kinds of things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I just presented is kind of frustration that these two initiatives are diverging, not converting. Uh, so, uh, so I'm very interested in finding a mechanism that can integrate these two diverging uh, efforts. So basically, the central government is uh, what I've mentioned is this is the start of a turning point. It's not in the middle, not in the end. So people are people seeing a lot of opportunities in this increased interest from the society on the mental protection. Everyone is thinking of opportunity on their own interest. So the central authority thinking this is the opportunity to expand and uh, uh, increase the political power, and uh, but uh, there are a lot, lot of uh, local initiatives that reflect strong uh, demand from the society due to economic uh, the better uh, environmental uh, quality and the value of uh, the environmental improvement. And as uh, I, I haven't seen the trend of converting of these two. And I uh, very much like to see it happen. 
Thank you. Unfortunately, we have to stop now because we are late, but I'm pretty sure that Europe and Europe will more and more debates about this precise event. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to our panelists.